In the U.S., the battle to turn our cities into less car-dependent places is honestly not going very well. But today we're going to look at 10 cities that are moving in the right direction and the things they're doing to make it happen. And this is a channel where the glass is both half full and half empty at all times. So I've got some pretty incredible dishonorable mentions too. It's the top 10 cities in the U.S. that are on the right track and it's coming up next. This is City Nerd, weekly content on cities and transportation, viewer suggested topics. Well, I won't go as far as to say they're the lifeblood of this channel, but they're definitely important today. This is another topic where I've had a lot of good suggestions and I'm just kind of consolidating them. The fastest improving metro areas, cities that are on the right track, cities that are becoming more walkable, and I do like this, but going through and inventorying how many miles of sidewalk or bike lane every city has added is more work than I want to do. Plus, I wanted to know about outcomes. Which cities have actually moved the needle on car dependency? I mean, if you spent billions of dollars on transit and protected bike lanes, but people still drive as much as ever, then did it really matter? So I'm just going to use census data. Commuting characteristics from the American Community Survey, or ACS, to find out which cities over the span of about 10 years have moved the most people away from driving and into transit, walking, and biking. And as we talk about these cities, we'll explore the things they've done that might have made a difference. Some notes on exactly what I did to come up with this list. First of all, I'm using cities proper, not metro areas. A lot of the improvements we're talking about happen at the municipal level. Infrastructure improvements, land use policy changes. Some things are regional, oftentimes transit, and that's fine, and we'll talk about that as we go through too. Because the ACS goes out to a small sample, about 3% of households every year, I'm going to use the five-year averages to help smooth out the noise. So I'm starting with the 2006 to 2010 five-year estimate, which is the earliest data set that's available in the web tool. And I'm comparing that to the 2015 to 2019 five-year estimate. The five-year estimates are available through 2021, so why only go through 2019? Well, first let's look at how the ACS categorizes commute mode. Besides transit, biking, and walking, they include a category called taxicab, motorcycle, or other means, which I assume would include ride hail. And they do have a work from home category. Well, look at what happens at a nationwide level in the five year data sets between 2010 and 2019. There's a one percentage point reduction in driving, but it's all accounted for by a one percentage point gain in work from home. Everything else is depressingly flat. So you can see technology was already enabling work from home before we even got to the pandemic and then it just started to explode. And work from home is interesting and important, but maybe a topic for another day. Because for this video, I just wanted to see the cities that did the best in increasing transit, walking, and biking before work from home overwhelmed everything else in the data. One other note on how I did this, I only looked at cities 200,000 or larger, partly because I was worried about the ACS sample size, but mainly because I don't want to bore you by talking about cities you've never heard of. There are 122 U.S. cities that meet the size threshold, and some of them are suburbs. This ends up being a list where the top 10 is just what the data say it is. But the challenge and the fun are in trying to interpret why these cities saw changes in travel behavior. It's a different story for each city, and for each of these I'm going to give you my theories, but I want to hear yours down in the comments too. And with that, let's get into it. Number 10 is New York. Let's just state right up front that it's a little depressing that all you had to do to make this list was increase your combined transit, walk, bike, mode share by 1.2 percentage points. In New York's case, 
The improvement came from increased transit use and biking. So what happened between 2010 and 2019? Well, the 7 extension and all the new density at Hudson Yards and the 2nd Avenue subway, not to mention assorted bus-only lanes. We also got pretty rapid expansion of the protected bike lane network, which was close to non-existent in 2010, and city bike didn't exist in 2010 either. So it's a lot of great improvements, but it really shows how hard it is to move the needle on mode split. Number nine is Salt Lake City, and this is almost all due to increased transit mode share, 1.6 points. The tracks light rail system has expanded a lot since 2010, a lot of it to the suburbs, but those extensions add a lot of utility for people who live in SLC proper too. You did get major expansions within the city too though, both an extension to the airport which rated well in my airport transit video, and the Sugar House line in 2013 with some new density. There's been some expansion of the front runner commuter rail as well. Did I miss anything? SLC folks, let me know. Number eight is Boston with modest improvement across the board, most notably the increase in bike mode share, almost a full percentage point. It's actually not that easy to pinpoint why biking is up a point. Blue bikes are new since 2010, and I was able to use the Strava heat map to look for likely suspects on the network, like Commonwealth Avenue, even though it's not a protected bike lane, there wasn't anything here at all in 2010, and it appears to be well used now. Bostonians, let me know what else I missed. Number seven is Portland, Oregon. This is small gains across the board, but they do add up. You've had important extensions on the Maxlite rail network, including the Green Line, which added stations in outer southeast on the way down to Clackamas Town Center, and the Orange Line, which added stations in inner southeast on the way to Milwaukee. There were lots of bike and ped improvements over those nine years. I'll give you some time slider imagery here, but behind all of this is a strong statewide planning framework, strong land use and transportation planning coming out of Metro, the Portland region's MPO, and TriMet, and a city bureau of transportation that doesn't always move as fast as people like, but it's almost always in the right direction. I'm happy to talk more about Portland style planning in a future video. Just let me know if you're interested. Number six is Jersey City. This is basically up 2.6 points on transit use and flat or worse on the others. A 2.6 point move over nine years is healthy though, so I had to figure out what the story was. Nothing really changed with the PATH network, but they did improve the signal system to allow more frequency at peak times. Probably more to the point, and I think this is a big factor for a lot of these cities. The population of Jersey City grew by 18% between 2010 and 2020, and you don't have to do too much time slider sleuthing in Google Maps to believe they added a lot of that 18% to new density around locations that are super accessible to transit. Number five, we're going to the Bay Area, and not for the last time on this list. This is Fremont, California, and the improvement here is also basically all transit, 2.8 percentage points. Unlike Jersey City, we can definitely point to transit network expansion here. BART extended the Fremont line and added a station at Warm Springs, South Fremont in early 2017, which doubled the number of stations in the city. The land use around the BART stations is, I don't know, I didn't spend a ton of time researching this, but someone please get down in the comments and tell me there's some kind of plan here, because this is the most expensive region in the country, and this just cannot be the plan. Number four is Chicago. This is the only Rust Belt-ish city that made the list, but then I've always felt like Chicago has been on a different trajectory compared to its neighboring cities. It's kind of in its own category. Anyway, the data say everything is moving in the right direction. Transit, biking, and walking, all up. Hard to say what's behind the transit ridership increase. There have been capital improvements, but nothing you'd expect to move the needle all that much. What's more the point, I think, is that Chicago's population has bounced back and a lot of the population growth has been downtown, up 45% between 2010 and 2020. 
there's been some residential infill in other places where there are good transportation options too. And the city has made lots of improvements to the bike network along the way. Number three is San Francisco. And this one has also improved across the board. The city added about 70,000 residents between 2010 and 2020. And I don't know exactly where those people live since it's so incredibly hard to build new residential there. But the city has made big multimodal improvements to its most visible streets like Market and Embarcadero, creating more space for transit priority and bikes. It's pretty great if you can afford it. Okay, I've got a pretty impressive top two and some dishonorable mentions coming up. But first, quick reminder to give the video a like and subscribe if this kind of content is your thing. Social media links always down in the description. I'm taking kind of a Twitter hiatus right now, but I'm on Mastodon at the same handle. And direct support on Patreon really does help keep this channel going. Dishonorable mentions. There are a lot of cities that were already crazy car oriented in the first place and then they just got worse over the study period. Like how hard is it to improve when the mode share for driving was already over 90% in the first place? Yeah, there are some really poor performing cities in places you'd expect like Texas, but outside of the Bay Area, California really isn't much better. With all the transit investment in Los Angeles, it's still going in the wrong direction. And basically every city in the Central Valley is atrocious. We're spending billions to serve these cities with high-speed rail, and I support that project, but man, it seems like there's a pretty critical need for better kinds of investment in the local transportation system. Going through this whole exercise, honestly made me feel like there are a lot of cities that have just given up on investing in transit and dense walkable communities. Instead, they're doubling down on car infrastructure and auto-oriented land use patterns, and it seems like they're just going to hope that the auto manufacturers ride to the rescue at the last second with clean electric vehicles. I mean, this is assuming those cities actually care about climate change in the first place. Sorry for the negativity, but I think a really important subtext of this whole video is that, like everything else in our country, cities themselves seem to be getting more and more polarized. Some cities double down on cars, and some cities invest a lot in making car-free or car-light living viable. So I do wonder how much of the changes in behavior are due to self-selection and migration. Like, how much of it is explained by progressive-minded people leaving hostile places and moving to cities where they can actually get by without a car? It comes back to the idea of vicious cycles and virtuous cycles. People who want to live in places that are designed solely for car travel migrate to those places or just stay where they are, and they become part of the constituency that supports the status quo. People who want to live in places that invest in transit and dense, walkable, bikeable communities migrate to those places and they strengthen the political constituency for more of those kinds of investments. It really is political and I think helps explain why urbanism is such a cultural lightning rod right now. And on that note, let's head back to the East Bay for number two, Oakland. Look, there are a lot of things we can criticize the Bay Area for. It's too expensive, it's too difficult to build new housing, there's nimbyism run amok. But relative to the rest of the US, the transportation planning is really good from the regional level on down. I've got three Bay Area cities in the top five, and if Berkeley met the population threshold, that city would be here too. Oakland's up almost seven points on transit, by far the biggest increase of any of the 122 cities I looked at. I mentioned BART line extensions when we were talking about Fremont, and the Oakland Airport connector came online in 2014 as well. I don't feel like just BART explains a seven point jump, but I'm not aware of any big service increases AC Transit did, so I just wonder if migration and changing demographics and people self-selecting Oakland as a place to live out their transit-oriented, walkable, bikeable fantasies is just part of the thing here. 
And that brings us to number one, a city that really has transformed itself over the last 10 to 15 years. And gold star for you if you were playing along at home and guessed it. It's Seattle, Washington, transit up about four points, walking up two and a half, biking up almost a point. So let's go through it. Central Link opened in July 2009, so most of that effect is not captured in the five-year data ending in 2010. And then you add the extension to the University of Washington in 2016, not to mention several rapid ride bus lines. So the region has invested a lot in improving travel times and reliability on major transit routes. Seattle made big strides in biking in the 2010s too, with new protected bike infrastructure and lots of neighborhood greenways. What puts Seattle over the top though is the increase in walking, which is maybe less about infrastructure and more about building more housing in locations that are accessible to lots of walkable destinations. Seattle's population grew by 21% in the 2010s. And if you go back to my theory of migration and self-selection, an uncharitable way of looking at this might be all the new condos in Seattle, and there are a ton of them, are filled with loathsome tech bros who live and work in places like South Lake Union. And yeah, there's some of that, but I think it's a much more nuanced story. And I have to say, one of the key things is the grassroots advocacy around transportation and the land use. Seattle is an absolute hotbed for urbanist activism. And it was notable a few weeks ago when I analyzed the top cities where this channel's viewership originates from, that Seattle punches way, way, way above its weight. I mean, they literally double up on any of the other 20 largest cities in the US. I think people there just care about this crap a little more than everyone else, and it's hard to explain why. Anyway, that's it. Let me know if you have thoughts on why Seattle shows up so big when it comes to urbanism, and let me know if you have insights on any of the other cities that made today's list. Thanks for joining today, and thanks as always to the patrons. The support from you guys really allows me to focus on this channel instead of having to go back and look for a job in traffic consulting or whatever it is I'm actually good at. Keep the great topic suggestions coming. I may be back with a new video next week. It's the holidays, so I'll see you when I see you.